Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to book club. Um, I think that might be you, Nostalgia. Are you using speaker? Because I'm hearing some reverb. Got to listen through headphones or something. Got it. My bad. It's okay. <laughs> anyway, welcome, everybody, to book club. Um, this is our 10th meeting. We'll be discussing the text by Friedrich Nietzsche, The Will to Power. Um, I posted a little study guide in the book club text channel. If any of you want to look at it for reference, I put some vocab on there and also a list of the different sections. It looks like pretty much everybody in here except for Kami is a first timer to book club so thank you all for being here so much i'm so excited um basically just so you know how this series usually goes oh yeah by the way sometimes my audio like cuts out and it sounds like i'm underwater if that happens can someone please just tell me because i hate listening to it later nobody says anything and it's just like 20 seconds of super muffled audio you can't hear so just say something please if it happens um, but basically how this series goes down, usually I lead it with my friend Michael. He can't be here tonight because he's um, an essential worker, and so he might pop in later. He usually helps me lead these. Um, we've been trying out a few different formats. Usually what I kind of do is just uh, start with like a basic overview, a synopsis, and then we go into like a more depth discussion together about the text, which usually broadens into a wider discussion about, you know, things like the relevance and modern applications of the text and yada, yada, yada. And um, most of you are new, but basically um, all of the texts that I've selected for this series are texts that go chronologically through the history of Western philosophy. I made the curriculum because I really wanted it to be like an introduction for anybody who doesn't have any experience in philosophy, especially to get acquainted with some of the most famous thinkers in Western philosophy. And all of the texts that I've selected are texts that have some sort of relevance to the thing that is ultimately called phenomenology. Um, and actually, next meeting, two weeks from today, we'll be reading, I'm like out of breath, pacing around, we'll be reading uh, Husserl, finally, who is the, really the, the phenomenology dude. I don't know how to say it. I don't want to say he invented phenomenology, but he kind of did as far as like a method. But we'll get into that next time. So be excited. This is the last text before we finally get to Husserl. So I'm really fucking excited for that. Um, so basically this text. Oh, yeah. One more thing before we get started. Um, if you could all, even the people who have been here before, if you could, when you start talking, introduce yourself with your name and maybe where you're from or your username, screen name, whatever. Like I said, these get posted. So if you want to hide your identity feel free, but just as a way to introduce each other and get acquainted with each other. Um, so this text, The Will to Power, which we read, I put this on the study guide too, just a little bit of background information about it. Um, basically, it was published in 1901, which is one year after Nietzsche's death. He died in 1900 when he was 55 years old. Um, and it was published, obviously, after he died, and it's really just kind of a collection of different writings that he did that was assembled posthumously by his sister, Elizabeth, who was a fucking Nazi-ass bitch, and also his friend, uh, what's his name? I know his fake name is Peter Gass, that was a pseudonym that Nietzsche gave to him. Oh, Heinrich Kuiselitz. Um, so this text was assembled posthumously, which you can kind of tell uh, that these are copy-pasted together just from the format of how it is. We're, we're reading the Walter Kaufman translation, and you see each paragraph has a different date for the time it was originally written and stuff. Um, and basically what we read for this meeting is uh, the section called The Will to Power as Knowledge. Not the entire thing, but parts one through six. Um, has anybody read this text before? Nope. Nope. Has anybody nah. read Nietzsche before? A little. A little? Just a little. <laughs> what did you read? What uh, did you guys read by him? I don't 
No. But I definitely, like, in my early philosophy courses, did some readings by him. Maybe one or two. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so I hope that you enjoyed this text. Um, Basically, the will to power. I mean, this whole text, uh, or the text that we read, I feel like it covers a part of Nietzsche that a lot of people who discuss Nietzsche, at least in, like, public discourse, I feel like don't really touch upon often, you know. Uh, It's kind of interesting how Nietzsche has come to have this, like, incredible fan base among conservative thinkers and stuff in particular, which I think is partially because of the fact that, you know, uh, his sister gave his writings to the Nazis who kind of fucked shit around and turned it around and made it into something that it was not. And he still has, like, a very strong fan base with these people. The same kind of people that are always railing against things like postmodernism, which is funny because Nietzsche is considered by uh, philosophers to be the forefather of postmodernism. And this text, I think, really gives some insights into why. Um, Basically, in this passage that we read, or these multiple passages, uh, Nietzsche is taking us through... Basically, his ideas and his theory about how a quest for knowledge and truth even came to be in the first place. And he basically takes us through an argument where he makes the argument that essentially, at baseline, our will to logical truths is found in our very biology, in our very bodies. And he explains how basically to try to come up with ways to explain like how we come to beliefs and stuff all of this all of this is ultimately erroneous and he believes that belief is a prerequisite for being itself um and he explains how uh ultimately the will to power is um the reason that we even come to create logic and schools of rational thought period um and that logic itself is our creation and it's only useful to us there is nothing outside of us uh that we are finding we are simply creating something and asserting our dominion and this is a process that he says is observable in the natural world um before we go into like a a breakdown of each section because i think we should just focus in on each one a little bit what did you guys think of this text what were your impressions of it did you like it (laughs) i I liked it my favorite started speaking oh this is elizabeth where are you Uh, speaking to us from elizabeth remember introduce yourselves Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Nice. Um, I really liked his section, the section belief in the ego, and then um, origin of reason and logic had me so shook. Um, <laughs> I think someone in the chat previously was saying, like, he just, everything is articulated so well. Uh, and I was just, I was very convinced by everything he was saying, basically. That's awesome. I, and I mean, just saying that, I feel like you said you were shook by the text. I feel like that's directly relevant to what he was saying in the text too, especially in the part when he's speaking about how ultimately truths are things that are felt almost like a command, you know, that nothing is inherently true, but if you assert it the right way, you know, if it's felt like a command, then it becomes law and it asserts its dominion and then it becomes an essential truth when really nothing is essentially true about it, you know. What what particularly got you feeling shook, if you can articulate that to us? I guess at one point he says, he said something along the lines of logic um, is attempting to, I guess, make sense of the world and make it calculable for us. Mm. And 
that in a combination with everything he said in the biology section was just really like I think solidified it in my mind like our processes of reasoning to come to these truths are just like part of our biology almost and Mm -hmm. therefore are not not truths in like the way that we um believe them to be I guess not Mm -hmm. absolute truths I don't know if that's the right word yeah totally and that's where that's a phrase that he even says himself and I know you weren't here for the Hegel reading but absolute truth is something that Hegel comes to talk about too in his phenomenology of spirit and a lot of what Nietzsche was talking about in this text for anybody uh who's been with us on our previous book clubs I mean The things he says about space and time as prerequisites of being, or at least our conceptualization of being, that really harkens back to our Kant reading. And he speaks directly to Aristotle and Descartes, both readers that both writers that we also read in book club. Um, So it's it's cool to see it all come together in the beginning of the 20th century, though it's been coming together for a long time. who else, who else was going to say something about whether or not you like the text or just your basic impressions of Um, I feel like I have a lot to say, but I can't think of it. Introduce yourself, ma'am. Hi, I'm Cami from New York. Hi, Cami from New York. <laughs> um, uh, shit. Uh. The co- <laughs> you were going in on that YouTube. I could tell you were high you as know, hell when I was I'm reading. To think of like what the fuck I was saying in the YouTube. Um, uh, when he said there's no facts, um, and logic, um, he's basically going in on logic about how it's no different than um <laughs> sorry <laughs> you're high as hell still <laughs> girl bye <laughs> okay. someone else grocery ace what about you what did you think of the text uh i'm ulysses i'm from the cd area for here um, from the what area? You just glitched a little bit. I mean, from the Seattle area. <laughs> it's still glitching. Oh my god, it's like when it doesn't want us to know. Okay, keep trying to talk for a little bit. If it's too glitchy, you might need to adjust your bit rate again or hop on your phone or something. Okay, yeah. Um, no, I just thought it was really interesting because um, I was in a class recently where we were talking about um, physics. And I just felt like his how this like a real like biological origin for the logic and kind of the methodology of reasoning that we've come up with. Um, it really reminded me of being in that class of learning about how we can be there's, there's not necessarily a unity in being kind of like what he was talking about. So, mm, like, in the last about, section. So, yeah, like we talked a lot about dilemmas of like how we refer to things and kind of like, I like what he said about species, especially where like there are no like kinds of delineation. Everything is totally separate from everything else and you can't say if the thing is anything else in itself. I think that was mm-hmm. my favorite. Yeah. Um, you are glitching a bit, so I don't know if you want to try adjusting yeah. your bit rate a little bit. I'll try try making it lower. Phone. Yeah, maybe use the phone. But but we got most of it. Um, wait, Minst <laughs> is here. Minst. Hey. hey! Finally! Oh my god, I've never heard your voice. Welcome. Are you drunk? Everyone here's fucked yeah. up. <laughs> nice. 
Well, Mince, you missed the intro, but basically everyone starts talking by introducing themselves with their name and where they're from. And if you would like right. to continue before we get into it, I was just asking the group to share some of their basic impressions of the tip. If you like them, anything with particular. Wait, can, um, Bethany, wait, can, you, can you speak? <laughs> Oh, oh it, was yeah. it lower? Oh, you're oh, good okay. now. Yeah, but... Uh, Thank you, so sorry. Somebody. Yeah, I was just saying, um, Mance, that everybody should introduce themselves with their name and where they're from. And I was just asking the group if they could share with us, and I want to ask you, just your basic um, impressions of the text. I'm sure you've read it already, but I know you reread it today. Do you like the text? Did you think anything about it is particularly profound? Give us your impressions. Down. But first, tell us your name <laughs> and where you're from. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I. This is a lot. Yeah, She's a fucked lot. up. Just, okay. just basic. Um, We're about to get into it. We're about to get into it item by item. So, just tell um, us you like it. Uh. Oh, okay. Hello everyone. How is everyone? Um, I'm Sage. Where am I? I'm in York. I'm not sure if any of you know where York is, but York is in Yorkshire. How far is that from London? <laughs> Very far. I'm close Very to far. Scotland. I'm actually closer to Scotland. Okay. It's a lot closer to Scotland. And then- its own island somewhere? No, it's on the same island. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cammy lived over there, they too. Wait, is Cammy on? Yes. That was Hi! me. Hey. <laughs> Hello, how are you? I'm good. All right, how so, are you? Did you like we... the text? Well, mm. I have thoughts. You always have thoughts. All right, maybe <laughs> maybe before we let you unleash those thoughts, we'll um, continue. But but, we're going to get into the specific ideas. Okay, yeah. we can do that. But I want to say, I love Nietzsche. I love Nietzsche so much. I Hell yeah. Um, okay, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Wait, I want yes! to ask Nostalgia. Nostalgia is new as well. Nostalgia, did you like the text? What were your impressions? Oh, yeah. Um, here's it going, guys. Nostalgia here. I'm Nick from New York. Um, I Welcome. really... Thank you for having me. Um, I thought it was really interesting. So, like, a little bit of background on me. I've, like, studied cogsci before, um, but focused mainly on, like, behavioral economics stuff. Um, so, like, I've had drive-by knowledge of perspectivism and uh, stuff related to philosophy. Um, but I think it's, it's I'm, I'm really interested in the club just to learn a little bit more. Uh, and I like the text. I was like, it was kind of kicking my ass um, a little bit, but I was <laughs> learning a lot as I went through it. And I think a lot of the um, ideas that were being described really like resonated with me. Mm. Um, so I think I'm just really excited to hear a lot of everybody else's feedback and more explanations. Yeah, as a cog side person, I imagine you have like so much insight you could give us as it relates to texts like this. And you said you had difficulty with the text. Like really, I mean, this is something I tell everybody who says they have difficulty with any of the philosophy texts. I think the difficulty is ultimately just like adapting to the language. Mm-hmm. Not just the, the one guy, but you know, every oh, philosopher yes. has such yes. a different, different speaking voice. Quirks as yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. And yeah, I think struts their thoughts. Oh, sorry, sorry. Continue. I think the no. way Nietzsche does it is like really good. It's like, Did you find that it was really yeah. easy to read? Um, yeah, yeah, I think well, he, I was really getting a lot out of it. Still, even though I was like still like kind of um, like getting used to a lot of the terms and stuff. Yeah, Gideon, you read it, yeah. Yep. Woo, Gideon! I'm so glad you're here. Wait, Gideon, introduce yourself so th- real quick. I, I I skipped I skipped the skipped the consciousness part because honestly, uh, I kind of didn't want to read read his thoughts <laughs> on consciousness. But uh, why? Uh, I don't know. I thought that was the most interesting part. 
Uh, I don't know. You should read just... it. It's very short. And he uh, he raised some contentious points. I feel like I may already know it just because um, I've looked into it in the past. But I, I'm not sorry, that I know I'm it, sorry, but, like, I have, like... Can you, I, can you repeat that? I feel like, no, like, that... I've, like, um... Which so part? Like, um, not that I know it, but more, like... I have like a basic, basic under or like a basic idea of what he may say, and okay, <laughs> I, I just kind of like whenever a philosopher speaks out of consciousness, I kind of like undermine it. I don't know. I feel like they're in the past, and I'm now. And you sound scared. <laughs> you sound like you sound like you're scared. He's gonna reveal some harsh fucking truths, and you can't handle it. <laughs> 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 it's more like uh, they're just in the past, bro. The future is now, old man. You know, dude. He know. died in 1900. What? That was like a millisecond ago in the history of humanity. Uh, I'm not trying to hear your modern elitist bullshit. Um, I live in the now, not in the past. <laughs> yes. Which All is right. Exactly anyway, this is so relevant this is exactly why this is so relevant and, and, and there's a reason why we're still discussing um philosophers such as Nietzsche it's it, it's not by error or mistake it, it, it's because there's a lot to to, to garner now and I think and I think what um what our issue really is, is 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 really based on how we're reading philosophy, especially philosophers like Nietzsche, because a lot of the time people are reading him from the 2020 perspective, which isn't the correct way of reading a philosopher. So I think mm. when we're when when we when, mm. when we get into it and we're like, okay, well, I, I I'm in the now, and why is this relevant? And that's a great that, that's a great place to start because that that's a great question is why would someone's philosophy be be relevant to me today? And the answer to that is based on whatever the fuck you're about to read. Mm. Yeah, because and also, and, and especially when he talks about rules to power. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, continue. Oh well, also I was gonna say. I mean, I think that even reading Nietzsche in the now, a lot of what he was saying are things that I think a lot of our modern day peers would find very contentious. Like, especially the section on consciousness. The stuff he was saying, I think, speaks directly to the conversation that we're having in the now about things like the potential of like artificial intelligence and ideas about like interfacing your neural systems with this or that and stuff it's all still very relevant (laughs) and he said a lot of things that i think a lot of people in the now would be like no how dare you you know so that's why maybe gideon was scared to read it but anyway Uh, let's let's get I, I, All right, we'll get into it later. True. Okay. Look, we have to we have to get into the nitty gritty right now. Okay, so let's go through item by item. There's only six sections, and um, we'll just summarize together the sections and make sure that we all have a comprehensive understanding of what it is exactly Nietzsche was trying to fucking tell us. So in this first section called the method of inquiry. Uh, the word method is really integral here because he starts this section by talking about how really method is philosophy and how method, everything that is venerable about things like our institutions of natural science isn't the science itself in the sense that it's not the body of data that the natural sciences represent, but the method that underlies it and the way that we do it, essentially. Um, And he speaks also about how um, essentially truth is something that's almost akin to an experience or an effect, he calls it, E-F-F-E-C-T, an effect, this aesthetic taste, he calls it, a picture of truth. That truth is ultimately sort of a presentation more than it's really some definitive thing that can be called true. It's something that is felt, you know. What did you guys think about this passage um, where he's basically just introducing us to how we already interface with a concept like truth? 
The truth isn't something concrete. It's just a method which sounds really abstract. Mm. Well, I think what he's saying um, is ultimately, yeah, like you just said, Cammy, that truth is not a concrete thing. It's it's something that we come to. It represents a process, you know, and how in the natural sciences, this thing is the scientific method, which really he kind of goes into. He doesn't say this explicitly, but really this whole text kind of is him outlining the scientific method. The scientific method being simply the idea that there is an observer and the observer starts with an observation, makes that the focus of some sort of inquiry, and then works through a process where they ultimately can reach some sort of conclusion or at least statement about the object of their inquiry, you know. That's basically what he's explaining throughout this whole text, both on a level, a physiological level, level even though he's not explaining the physiology of that mechanism itself. He's explaining kind of how, because this is our baseline state of being, it makes sense that our modes of rationality and logic sort of follow this trajectory. But then, and why Gideon should really read the part on consciousness, it's interesting because he basically says that consciousness as we conceptualize it uh, is not beholden to this very process. But we'll get into that. I feel like the first section is pretty self-explanatory. He starts to get a little more mm, in the now, I guess, in the second section, which is called the epistemological starting point. Um, epistemology means, tell the group what epistemology means, please. Oh my god, I keep going on about this. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't give us really don't give us really what you think to... it is. Just tell us tell us what no, intro to philosophy. I, 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 I think you're better at giving people um straight, clear cut definitions for things. <laughs> does any, fine, does I, anyone I else tend, know? <laughs> because I tend because I tend to drone on. And you know I've been speaking about um the uh, episteme and epistemological oh, worldview. Oh, true. Like not... thoughts here. And, and, and I have not stopped. And even Dylan's just been going like, yeah, okay, again. <laughs> <laughs> so... oh, you have such a lovely speaking voice. I wouldn't mind listening to you drone, but I understand. You have, you have too many thoughts here. <laughs> but... I'll tell them. <laughs> Unless someone else wants to tell us. Someone else wants to tell us what epistemology is. Grocery aches. We're getting some Grocery. wind from your mic. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> what are you in a tornado? Okay. Little too close. That? <laughs> yeah. I got too close to the fan. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad we could hear you clearly now. <laughs> Is that better? Much better. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cool. you were like glitching. It probably just has to do with weird can't hear that settings. Person. You could adjust later. <laughs> what, Gideon? You can't hear them. I hear grocery. You might grocery. have muted me? him. You might have muted I... him by accident because we can hear him. Is his mic? You might He's have pressed muted. his mic. Let me... Oh. Well, he was talking. I don't... Maybe it was just a weird thing. But anyway, um, the second part, the second section is the epistemological starting point. Um, and basically, epistemology, for anyone who doesn't know, is the study or theory of the nature and grounds of knowledge, uh, especially with reference to its limits and validity. So basically, an investigation into the starting point of knowledge, you know. And in this text, or this section of the text, um, Nietzsche basically is giving us an argument that I think most of us are probably familiar with by now in 2020, and which we've already touched on, this idea that knowledge should not be seen necessarily as something, some process of uncovering truths. Um, rather, it resembles something that is more active and creative and springs from ourselves, you know. There is Rhizomatic. no fundamental... Mm. What? Rhizomatic. Rhizomatic? What's yeah. rhizomatic? What yeah, what's that? that? Um, so, Deleuze, Deleuze and Guattari, um, who are influenced by Nietzsche as well as Foucault, the, the idea is that knowledge, knowledge, I mean, how we've seen history from the very beginning has always been as a timeline. 
And instead, the idea is that um, knowledge and where we are is we're at the peak of knowledge. But the idea is that that's not how knowledge necessarily works. Oh, I get it. It springs out like like, like a rhizome, you know, like how you see um, a map of a a train. Oh, a rhizome. Yeah, so it's all connected. Like, it doesn't spring out like Mm. a tree, but instead comes out like a leaf. That, yeah. that's the idea of how knowledge works and that's really um, relevant man i think to a lot of like, what he was saying it's like reading a game of thrones the game of thrones or a song of ice and fire and like there's like a hundred chapters and they all take place at like 10 or like you'll read the first book but like the whole book of the first book is like takes place in different times and you like start to have an idea of when what part of you know fuck it no, i'm sorry I, I get it was like i i think what mince is saying golden eras you know well what what mince was just kind of speaking to is how like the the trajectory of philosophy doesn't necessarily represent any sort of linear timeline you know like okay plato Mm. discovered this and then aristotle did this and because aristotle did that descartes could do his thing and then because descartes could do this then Kant could do his thing it doesn't really work that way and it's true i think that certain concepts by key thinkers become integrated in a way where you can see some sort of working towards something but ultimately, you know, it's absolutely true what Minch just said, like that this really isn't any sort of linear process. And the history of philosophy kind of speaks to this, too, because a lot of what it is is one guy coming and basically almost raising the ground like fucking philosophy 9-11 and being like, actually, this is the new thing. And then some other guy tears his thing down, even if it appears to just be some slight modification. It's really just this constant bombing and then rebuilding a new thing and it's just this endless process that ultimately begins to look kind of futile for reasons that i think nietzsche really is speaking about in this text um and in this uh, this section the epistemological starting point um he says some really interesting things i think a lot of it is pretty self-explanatory and ideas that most of us are already acquainted with Um, But I think what was really most compelling about this part and really a little bit confusing, I had to read it a few times, um, where he's speaking specifically about the fiction of causal relationships. He says that all causal relationships are fictions, um, including ones that are represented by our ideas of like intention in the sense that, you know, because the doer does something, therefore something is done. He says that this whole Mm. thing is imaginary and it made me think uh specifically of the david hume text we read and anybody who hasn't read that i encourage you to go back the pdf is on our website i think it was one of the best texts we read and also one of the easiest to understand and also one of the most influential texts because this text by david hume is basically him explaining how cause and effect even in science is totally an illusion it's not something that can be proven if i pick up a rock and drop it even if i do this thing a thousand times and repeat the action i still will never have proof or evidence that one day i might pick up the rock and open my hand and it just floats to the fucking sky there's really no way to incorporate Uh, a theory of cause and effect into science in a way that is truly philosophically sound or coherent. It's something that almost becomes treated as a given, you know. Um, And so Nietzsche talks about how this this entire uh, conceptualization of causal relationships as being fictional in and of itself. And it's interesting, and this is the part that I had to reread, where he says that in our inner world, because in this text he talks a lot, he oscillates between the outer world and the inner world often. He says in the inner world, this causal relationship between cause and effect is actually inverted. Whereas in the outer world, um, we see a thing happen and then something follow that action. And that is our understanding of cause and effect. He says in our inner world, uh, we start 
essentially with the effect and then we look for the cause through a groping of our memory i.e i start with a statement he gives the example of i feel unwell you know in your inner world you say this to yourself i feel unwell and then you tell yourself why you feel unwell you know but uh, when i first read that i i felt that that was a little confusing and this this section in general i felt was a little hard to parse through but after rereading it i feel like i kind of understand it better and it's also where he first introduces the will to power as a phrase at least in this reading um does anyone have anything uh any thoughts about this section or these ideas before we move on So, no. um, uh, just, oh, there we just go. a quick question. Wait, are we, um, so are we going to move, when, when we do move on, are we moving on, um, from which section, the first section down mm -hmm. to the, is up to number three. So between there and there, we're covering all of this, right? Yeah, I just figured we should go through, um, it's six sections that we read. Just go okay. through each one and summarize, and then I want to have a broader discussion where we could go wherever the fuck we want, including back to anything that I'm saying, you know? I just wanted to make sure that we go through each part and make sure we understand each each independent section before we start having a conversation about the context, you know? Yeah, well, it's, um, yeah, as uh, I'm asking uh, specifically because the, um, all right. This is when he's talking about coll collective influence, <clears throat> human consciousness. Um, I'm not sure about that. The only time I really uh, remember him mentioning anything that has to do with, like, group thinking would be when he speaks a little bit about herd mentality as this thing that influences us in the background of all of our thoughts. But I feel like that was in a bit of a later section. Yeah. I feel like something that just struck me as you were going through and explaining that over um, is, I think, that the, the, the way that there's an ex external scientific method I wonder if, like, the scientific method of the inner world is equally mirrored um, and whether, like, we would be able to, like, deduce further inner, like, levels um, based on causality, um, I guess, if we, if we follow that rabbit hole down. Well, that's basically where he ends up going, right, in the yeah. last section, where he basically says that this process does not... Well, he hasn't really gotten into the process yet. He's about to, but he speaks about how this uh, cause and effect that we observe in the outer world, the same thing, the same observations that he uses to base really his entire philosophy here about how he thinks that the will to logic and rational thought is a representation of our biology itself. He speaks about how it's dangerous to fall into the trap of thinking that this same mechanism is at play in our inner world and in our consciousness. And he explains how really we should not be using this uh, as a thing to look to when trying to understand our own processes of cognition, you know, um, which, which is funny and controversial. Okay, yeah, sorry. I just want to plow through. I just want to make sure that, that we cover each part. It's about to get to the controversy, so let's just do that real quick. So the next section is belief in the ego, the subject. Um, in this in this part, he says um, he basically is laying the groundwork for his perspectivism. He says how basically a critique of knowledge is senseless, and how it is dangerous to use what we uh, observe about ourselves to try to know about ourselves. He says that there's no facts, only interpretations. Even an inter even a statement like everything is subjective is ultimately still an interpretation because in this statement, the subject becomes a given, you know? And this still is working within a rigid mode that only comes to us by way of a thing that we already built. So we can't use the thing we built to critique the thing, you know? Um, I felt that this was all pretty, pretty, these are ideas that we probably are familiar with, 
already. Um, and he also starts to, in this section, he, he introduces uh, an argument for why he thinks that the body itself is the starting point. Um, and this is the next se section. And this is where I think he starts to get really interesting and really controversial in section four, biology of the drive to knowledge, perspectivism. Um, he opens this section by saying that truth is a necessary error for the survival of the species. Essentially, that truth is a thing that is essential to our survival. And he says that because this is true, the value for life is ultimately decisive. That's a quote. Um, he says, too, that our processes of human perception, everything that comes to us by way of our uh, perception, is selective. Um, you know, the senses that we have are not the senses that other species have. And he says that this reveals kind of a limitation and that consciousness, the thing that emerges from these processes of perception working together, is only present insofar as it is useful, you know. Um, so our perspective <clears throat> is limited by our needs. Yeah, exactly. And that everything that culminates essentially in this feeling of being conscious is a reflection of our very specific selective perceptions. So yeah, that, that's totally right. Um, he talks about this process of cognition itself, how it really starts with an image, an aesthetic, you know, the thing that is immediately present to us in our perceptual phenomena, and how we use these images to then create words that are applied to these images. And then with these words, we build concepts, and that concepts are only made possible through words. Um, and basically, he, he, everything he is saying uh, in this section is um, his argument for, for how he thinks we could feel confident in a belief that ultimately our processes of logic and of science follow something that is biological. And knowing and thinking is ultimately a prerequisite. This is a mode that we're trapped in from the day we are born. You know, you can't turn it off. These are ideas that I think uh, would probably present as controversial to a lot of people, um, even in the now, you know. And that's part of why I still think that this text is very relevant. I think this is something that we're coming into and that Husserl really took up for himself after him. Uh, and basically the entire institution of neuroscience, which nostalgia, I'm sure you have a lot of thoughts here. Like, what are your guys' impressions of these kinds of ideas? Like, do you feel like they're controversial to you or to other people? Like, what, what are your thoughts about this? This is where Nietzsche is starting to take us somewhere unique. I think, like, when you look at it, especially I feel like now, a lot of people are talking about, in philosophy, free will is like a very kind of, I don't want to say up and coming, but it's very popular, especially now with like neuroscience. Um, philosophy, but people in philosophy just can never get over the free will thing. It's yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> so it's, interesting to, it's interesting to think about this like um, in relation to free will just because he's talking about how we like interpret the world kind of through the lens of our biological needs mm -hmm. which it kind of it's very i guess it kind of goes like hand in hand but like loosely hand in hand with determinism yeah can you explain what determinism is for anyone who's not familiar? Um, well, there's like a few, like a couple different ways of looking at it, but I guess just like the belief that everything that's happening was going to happen because of things that happened previously. Is that a good mm -hmm. way to put it? Or, yeah. um, I guess like one. It, the way it was described to me in like my intro to philosophy course um my freshman year was like our brains are just matter that like the laws of physics apply to so everything that's happening in our brains is just like happening because it's matter that 
it corresponds with what's already happened and will con- like uh, leads to what will happen in the future, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like contrasted with free will in that way. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately why determinism and free will are at odds with each other, these are the two competing ideologies, is because determinism tells us essentially that in any given moment, you are the perfect sum of everything that has ever happened to you up until this moment. And so in that sense, even though I feel like I have a choice, do I want to eat the sandwich or do I want to eat the soup? Ultimately, even though I play out this decision, it's ultimately kind of a facade and whether I eat the soup or whether I eat the salad or sandwich, whatever the fuck I said, is ultimately determined by everything else that leads up into that moment. And and in that sense, my choice has already been made for me. Um, And this is a thing that a lot of people find depressing or something. And it almost becomes like a spiritual battle for people at least that's the effect of it or the aesthetic presentation of it i think because this becomes such a sensationalized thing and i think this is part of why people feel so strongly especially um about these ideas as they relate to consciousness they just cannot accept that like oh no like i am not this free thinking free agent uh, like everything there, there's limitations to everything that i can be or i can do that are placed uh with constraints of like matter and shit but it's like and i think nietzsche really in the last section especially um and part part of Nietzsche's gift, and I think why he resonates with so many people, is because he really reframes this idea for us uh, in a way that I think is really moving, you know? Like, it's not even that he's saying anything different, but he makes the argument, like, to do this is to make humans akin to a god. To say a thing like consciousness is something that exists outside of the constraints of our own physicality is to turn humans into gods, you know. And for a lot of people, I think that that's what they want, you know. But Nietzsche is so, I mean, all of his writing is so characterized by this intense, fiery fucking love for humanity as it is, you know. He doesn't want to give in to any illusions about what it is we are. He wants to confront the reality of exactly what it is we are and assert his will to power (laughs) and the dominion of mankind into the fucking world, you know? It shouldn't depress you to think about these sorts of things like, oh, my physicality impedes this or this, that process. It's not really an imposition uh unless you make it one unless you characterize it that way in your own fucking head but why would you do that what would be wrong about that you know fucking love I, yourself yeah yeah, yeah. I, I definitely, definitely I'll go. wait i'll go after you you can go first okay go I was, ahead uh, i'm gonna say uh, uh i've noticed that a lot of times when i end up getting into a conversation about free will and determinism. Uh, most people would, it, it usually ends into like referring to free will as being, having the choice to trans- transcend into a God or some sort. And I think it's funny that it just always plays out that way. Yeah, like, especially as it relates to AI, I feel like. It's always like, oh, there'll be some pure, perfect moment where the AI makes its own decision. Like, what? When is that (laughs) line? Where is that line? But no. Um. Wait, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. I was gonna say we big ass arguments in class about this kind of stuff, and you could see like people get really frantic over the idea that like, oh no, this thing I've been studying and majoring in is about to tell me that like I don't have a soul. Um, and and I don't know. I I personally like. I think I'm more aligned with where he's, where he's coming from now. Like I think that you know we'll we'll figure out more about it. But we really are a collection of sensors, you know, and really sophisticated and like super low latency. But like that's that's yeah. sort of like all we are. And I think it's at, wait. Sorry, was somebody else trying to go? Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. You were talking. I'm sorry, yeah. sorry, I was listening. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think honestly, like from my perspective, I don't need to be a, um, I don't need to be a god. I actually think it's more beautiful 
that we have all these experiences and we have all this, um, that these things happen, like the fact that like love exists and that people like do all these things and it's just like a collection of atoms um, is I think more interesting than uh, the existence of a soul instead. But I, I understand that there's other like, viewpoints. Well, I, I think also the way you can think about it, too, is it's not even that consciousness is just, you know, oh, I'm just a computer and everything in my brain is just carrying out this or that process. I have no control over it, especially with Nietzsche. I feel like he still retains in his own. Hello. Hello. Oh. Uh, yeah. Just, your mic isn't working. Oh no. They got to her for spreading the good news. <laughs> um, assassinated by, nostalgia. by the same uh, people that killed Nietzsche. Rip Bethany. Uh, nostalgia? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to ask you, when when you were talking about um, is someone someone getting into uh, philosophy, and then, and I think you you were speaking about um, Nietzsche specifically, and 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 sort of this ego death. This is an inverted commas. Um, this ego death. Um, that occurs when someone reads uh, philosophy. Um, I, I think that's such a great way to put it, because mm. in, in if we are talking about the context of 2020 within the context of 2020, yes. we're not talking about you know the death when when he speaks about you know God is dead. We're not talking about you know God is dead in the same way we would be if we were talking in the 30s, right? Yes. Because yes. And, and and that's what I think is so great about what you just said, because the greatest question we have here when uh, Nietzsche is talking about ego, he's referring to what is now becoming the world, the world, how the world is, 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 is giving birth to itself and that mm -hmm. we all collectively go through this crisis of identity. And because we have automatic access to, uh, 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 to a strong, uh, uh, reference point, right? Because we always have something to reference to. Religion, you 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 don't really want to make dis the decisions you have to make. Therefore, you rely on religion to make the uh, decisions for you. Mm -hmm. And then it happens again with um, you know your psychiatrist, your psychologist. And the idea here was that because people didn't really have this. Um, that, that, that people have this importance, the, the importance of their identity isn't even based on their own identity, mm -hmm. is something very, very interesting about Nietzsche's thought itself. And when he speaks about, okay, I think later on he starts to speak about um, the the recurrence and the dream. I'm not sure if, if it gets there anywhere, but um, fuck, I'm going to go on. Someone <laughs> stop me because I'm not gonna... oh God. you know what's very interesting i i, I think I she's will... back I, 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 yeah I will... sorry i don't know what happened keep going Steve. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, um oh, sorry sorry uh uh was someone saying something no no you you, you were going you were oh, about to tell us about on. these dreams go on no like i uh, i just um fuck i just completely lost where i was oh but 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 here's here's um a very s small uh, uh example mm -hmm. um right the the uh I'm, I'm not sure if 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 um sorry i'm just trying to to gather so the, okay so this is a very silly example but um <laughs> Uh, Di Huberman is in front of the the Fra uh, Beato Angelico. It's 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 the Madonna of the Shadows, right? And it's a fresco that was produced during the uh, middle of the Italian Renaissance in the 15th century. So it's in the east corridor of the dormitory of the um, Florence's San Marco Monastery. Now, th this is this is an example on 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 on. Um, 
uh, uh, Nietzsche, right? And 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 oh, fuck, I think I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go on here, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try and like do find it. A way to like <laughs> cut it. But so so mm-hmm. what Hubermas does, and and the same with uh, Thomas Kuhn, who uh, these are people who are are historians of both science and uh, historians of philosophy. It's now. What he does is that Uberman is standing in front of the um, Fra uh, uh, Angelica, and he goes through. He he so, so he's a huge Jackson Pollock fan, and he goes through something that's very strange because he's looking at a 15th century fresco, and he looks at it and he thinks, "Damn, th- th- this kind of reminds me of a Pollock." Yeah. And he, so the, the whole idea is on the um, the uh, heterogeneity of um, uh, histories, and he's trying to introduce uh, anachronism. And what happens, and, and and what happens here, is he basically tears down the whole idea that people have of of history and how people attach themselves to history and how people see history. Because all of the time when we're looking back at history, we have this idea of, well, we're in 2020 and we already know what we know. And obviously we're smarter and better than the people that came before us because we're not rogues. We're not doing what rogues used to do. We're not like hmm. employing all of these really crazy uh, uh, things that people do to justify why they do the things that they do. Mm-hmm. And he goes on, he goes on a bit, but here he has a, a really interesting um idea in that when 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 one is in any moment of of history you 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 don't really um you, you can never know and this is something that a lot of philosophers are talking about currently still which is why Nietzsche is very important still is that you can never move beyond your own episteme which is the epistemological framework that you work that, that you work within. So the ego is not necessarily, you know, you as a person, but it's the small things that you deem to be. It's it, it's the small things that make you who you are, and those small things are not even who you really are. If that makes any sense. So things like things like the things that you know, the things that you learn. The, all of these things, things like religion, when he speaks about God being dead, he's not necessarily saying that, you know, okay, well, God is dead and we have killed him, right? What he's, what he's trying to say is that we are going to go through uh, shifts and specifically now where we look back, where we, we're, we're looking back within history and we're still scrambling about uh, history whilst within history, but we're forgetting the fact that we are in a moment of history. And therefore, whatever we're working within is still, again, a moment within history. So we cannot judge what we're going through because we're working within an episteme. Does that make sense? I hope that made sense. No, no, I don't. I, get, I, I see. No, that totally that, makes that's sense. That's like beautifully like articulated. Of, of the ego. I'm sorry if that made, if that didn't make. But, but pistabe is just a fancy word for the, like the generations of mankind that are already embedded in us. Oh. Yeah, well, think, basically. Basically. Yeah, and but yeah, no, that totally made sense, Sage. Like this idea that everything, even the things that you think are your most personally held sentiments, you know, and the in most your house. unique. And you're like knocking on the door, but you're inside the house, and you're like, <laughs> open up. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And, and the idea the caller is inside the house. When he speaks about love, when he starts to like speak about love and and um, power, so when he's talking about power, he he doesn't have anything against power, but he wants you to understand what your own idea of power mm-hmm. is. So when he makes the, the example of okay, you have a boyfriend or you have a girlfriend, and knowing that that person likes you, that is a moment of power. When he th- that that's what he's talking about. It's these series of moments of power when you believe you know something. 
Yeah, and I'm so mm. glad that you bring this up because this is the next section. This is the. Ne- Can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. The, the 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 what you just said, Sage, like brings us right into what Nietzsche goes on to say, where he elevates us out of this argument. Is she talking? Yeah. 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 The fuck? All right, I'll, I'll be right back. Gideon keeps <laughs> muting people. <laughs> no, um, yeah, what, what you just said, Sage, um, and Nietzsche in this next section, section five, Origin of Reason and Logic. He... Wait, were you talking the whole time? No, I me? think she went, out for, she went out for a little bit, but she's been back now. I've been back. Can you hear me? <laughs> she, like, you cannot I hear me. I heard you. I, I hear you now. Mute. Oh. I you're I probably muting have, people on accident. I'm not muting anyone. You, you, your well, voice just, is just... just just hang up and come back because that's what <laughs> happened to me. I stopped hearing everyone and said I was still here. I had to leave just and come know, back. How long have you have you been speaking? Was it over a minute? No. <laughs> okay. I, I don't right. know. Not long. Anyway, let's let's continue. Um. So so this thing that Sage was just talking about about power. Um. This is for what Nietzsche goes on to say in this fifth section, Origin of Reason and Logic, where he's just explained to us why he thinks that the drive to knowledge itself is rooted in our biology. And then he uh, begins to lay out his theory of the will to power itself. Um, He says in this section, early on in this section, this is the longest section of all of them. He says a lot of things in this section. And pretty early on, he says, uh, this is a quote, he says, the will to equality is the will to power. And I thought that that language was kind of interesting because at first presentation, I don't think it makes immediate sense. But he kind of explains how really um, logic, uh, the, the, the compulsion to categorize and schematize our external phenomena make everything fit into categories is essentially a process of equalization where we're trying to make things fit into these categories that we create and in that sense we're asserting our dominance over everything around us and this is how it works on multiple levels um like he said earlier that uh you know the truths that have the most effect of of being the most true, feeling the most true, uh, work almost like a command, and then we integrate them into our philosophies and certain things become a priori, the things that seem most given or most true. Um, The thing that I thought was the most interesting about this passage uh, and something I had never thought about was when he talks about um, the laws of contradiction um specifically he harks back to aristotle he talks about aristotle who introduces this idea in philosophy um this idea that two opposite things cannot be true a thing cannot be true and cannot also be hard um and if this is true that a thing cannot be be soft sorry a thing cannot be soft and cannot also be hard two opposite things cannot be true if this is true it reveals one of two things either either it's true in actuality that a thing cannot be soft and cannot also be hard or it's only true to us and this is the thing that seems much more likely and in that sense that would reveal a limitation of our own logic essentially an incapacity for two opposite things to be true it's not that two opposite things can't be true in actuality it's that two opposite things cannot be true to us and I thought that that was super interesting and it's super relevant, especially um, we're talking about things like AI and all this stuff, you know, mm-hmm. AI is a thing that is only going to become possible really with quantum computing where essentially two opposite things or maybe not opposite things, but well, yeah, two opposite things can be true simultaneously, you know, quantum processes and, and superpositions and all this bullshit, oh you know, yeah, that is and like it, it really made me think of yeah and it really made me think of hegel and why the hegel reading got me so fucking depressed because i feel like (laughs) this makes me come back to reality though i feel like nietzsche was the mood booster i needed because after reading hegel where hegel is uh talking about his dialectic where basically he's saying all that nietzsche is saying in this passage that you know 
things can maybe things can be true and also hard just not to us you know and if this is true and what we're doing with philosophy what we're attempting to do is to try to create an intelligible system with which we can actually interface with our outer world and the phenomena of our experience in it if this is true then maybe this task is going to be so much more arduous than any of us ever pictured like what are we supposed to do with these realizations do we have to make quantum philosophies which is essentially what Whoa. hegel Whoa. basically <laughs> which, which is essentially what hegel is, is it, that's why i got so depressed after reading the hegel because i feel like that's what he's telling us we have to do if you want to have any comprehensive philosophy you need to create a quantum one you know and so maybe it's me being lazy but the nietzsche really <laughs> makes me feel a little better because Nietzsche's like, fuck it, man. Like, yeah, it's true. You like that sometimes. <laughs> My favorite part was true. when he says... Quantum philosophy, what would that look uh, like? My favorite... Impossible. <laughs> but go, ahead, go ahead, Gideon and then Mince. I hear Mince trying to say something too. Gideon and then Mince. Uh. I did, uh, my favorite part was when he said, you can't, you can't will the truth. I thought that was solid. That was some real shit. Was that that mm. part where he said that? It was like after talking about, like at the end of that. Well, part, I know that in this part, he said, he said, truth is the desire to be master over the multiplicity of sensations. I was like, yo, mm. put that on a fucking t-shirt. That was the quote. That was the shit I love. My favorite part, which basically summarizes, uh, yeah, everything I feel here. Mince, what were you just gonna say? No, I was, I was, um, no, I forgot. I forgot. I completely forgot. No, but um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I think going back to what I remember who said what, but um. Fuck, I completely forgot what, <laughs> what someone said. Because, was it about... um, yeah? I think what it was, was me it? talking about quantum philosophy. I heard you go like, but... Yeah, well, well the, the thing, my, my thing is, is that I, I can't believe that Nietzsche would make you feel better about the world than, than, <laughs> than Hegel. Because Why? W w when Nietzsche just basically oh. says, what if the very act of you as a person conducting science at all carries too many cultural values that narrow and distort even your very finding that whatever you find and the very fact that you go and you seek out this knowledge and even your methods are based on whatever whatever narrow way that people within your way of doing science do science i mean how is that not a mind it's a mindful, but Nietzsche makes me feel better because ultimately he says that that's okay for me, you know, and that all of what we are doing is a representation of my human biology and also the history of humanity itself, you know, and so it's totally true. I think that, you know, it's depressing to think about how, like, the limitations, all these limitations are imposed on us, not only by ourselves, but by the history of us and everybody who came before me that invented this stupid way of categorizing this or that, and now I just have to work with it because it's the only software I have installed in my fucking psyche, you know? Yeah, but At the how same is that time. Fucking with you. Like, how is because, the because, because that the thing that made me depressed, the thing that made me depressed, Mint is is that I felt like the task Hegel was setting before me was impossible. I feel like what he was saying was that the only way to have a comprehensive philosophy is essentially to create one that's quantum, where opposite things can be true. And maybe that is true, but and that's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. what we have to be doing. I but that. That's going to that's gonna ruin my whole week. philosophy <laughs> tries <laughs> to, to, to make sense is when analytic and continental philosophy come together. Because it was the question, right, that uh, a a analytic uh, philosophy had, is that if something is a priori, then it can't be uh, verifiable. I mean, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be verifiable, right? But, 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 but the question is this, right? Um, if, we, if, 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 if we are in the English spring, and tomorrow it will be sunny and warm and then the next day it will rain 
you do not have you, you cannot verify that yesterday which yesterday it was hot right you cannot verify you cannot empirically ver- verify that it was hot yesterday but you know that it was hot yesterday because you already knew that it was hot yesterday mm-hmm. so even if something cannot be verified even if you cannot verify something you know it just by the fact that it happened right but right. that still but that still sits in between something being something that is verified because you knew it happened but you cannot go and 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 and, and test it again because it happened therefore it can't exactly be a real science but it's still something that you that everyone can agree happened right <laughs> right but you can still have a discussion on that yeah right but then the question is is that how unavoidable are these limitations if they are put in whatever na- whatever narrow scope that they are because how many people can verify that something, that whatever happened and how many people do you need to verify whatever happened and happened well because then this is yeah. the question is that you we we have then you then we have to figure out where we put it in a category right and then it still has to be viewed through whatever we are missing out on no matter how much information we have <clears throat> who decides what is crucial and what isn't because well, that's the whole thing about being a human being right but i think that that's exactly it and that's why i find nietzsche comforting because you know everything he's saying is essentially that you know even this mode of hegel the thing that got me so depressed where he's basically <laughs> saying if we want if we want things if we want to have a comprehensive philosophy then we need to make opposite things true nietzsche basically says you know well actually philosophy is not really an uncovering or a way to make the natural world makes sense rather we are imposing it on limitations that we create you know it's not that w- it's true that in a certain conceptualization that we are limited by certain things but you know even that understanding of the limitation is still a byproduct of our human episteme you know so really any critique from any angle of knowledge itself is still trapped within this mode you know and ultimately it's sort of arbitrary to try to make it make sense because it never will and i like nietzsche how he basically says that you know everything that we have come up with was come up with on a biological level even for ultimately its usefulness and what it affords us you know so i think it's really ultimately just a reframing and giving agency back to the human thinker you know and it it really depends how you look at it you know we could see it as a limitation of our own consciousness and i think it is in a certain consideration at the same time you can also look at it as if i am imposing limitations on the natural world you know If you don't make sense, I'm going to make you make sense. And that's exactly what he says. He says that w- w- the world is rational to us because we made it so, you know. True. So that's but- why I love it cuz he's like, "Bitch, I you I I'm never going to find a perfect way for you to work. I'm going to make you work." Well, the thing is, Very exclusive. Um, I I I love book. I love oh, inclusive, I- my bad. Sorry. God. I absolutely love Nietzsche, but what I'm saying is is that and and I and I appreciate Nietzsche a lot more than I would Hegel. But my question is this, what, what brings you more comfort? The idea that you can move from subjectivity you know that you live in subjectivity but you can find objectivity at some point that the goal is objectivity and you can find it or that you already you already assume that objectivity exists therefore subjectivity can is so you cannot move from the idea that objectivity exists to get to subjectivity and to find objectivity because whatever you deem to be objective is subjective anyway how much of a mind fuck is that well i don't think objectivity this period though yeah but I mean, it's not that comforting <laughs> I'm confident, bitch. Did I'm you just like the <laughs> No, you know I I like 
I like that what, what Nietzsche does is basically take everything that I think is sorrowful about what you're saying that I very much relate to. You know, this, these ideas that, like, there are so many limitations. They reveal themselves at every fucking turn. Everywhere I go, it's like, okay, well, this was... I'm only working within this construction of knowledge to try to better the institution of knowledge itself. I have no control over that process. I also have no real control over my very processes of observation that underlie these processes of rational thought. Everywhere I turn, it feels like I am powerless you know, and that's why I like Nietzsche because I feel like he's reclaiming this idea that like we are active participants in this process. And it's true that a lot of what we do uh, in the realm of creating our philosophies and our logic and constructing our own personal worldviews about everything around us, it's true that these are reactionary processes, but it doesn't mean that we are not also active participants in this process, you know, Absolutely. that we still have a drive to something and there is an impulse that that propels us in any motion you know we at baseline are doing something whatever it is we're fucking doing is really up to us to articulate in our philosophy but it's undeniable that we are doing something and so i like that he frames it in this way where he basically gives agency back to us as humans and as thinkers and it's it's the method you know this process of doing something that is philosophy it's not that we're ever going to find the perfect arrangement and it will all fall into order and make perfect sense one day you know this it's this never-ending process of doing and creating and that's why i'm comforted by it, you know? i think uh that uh, and i think inherit inherently i think uh what was it i was gonna say oh yeah um that like uh like all, all that like all that is objective is uh i think like what he's what he's saying or the way i took it is like anything objective doesn't really matter because i'm gonna keep on ah oh, fuck i forgot what i was really thinking i was trying to recreate it but um, i lost it hmm. oh yeah what, what um, are you gonna say Oh. oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. it's okay. Is that nostalgia I heard about to say something? Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to like, I'm gonna have to read this. Got to like build up um, something about that, that um, quantum uh, <laughs> philosophy thing. Something like shook, shook me before about like how would you, if you had to make something from one person's perspective, both hard and soft. Um, and maybe like I was looking, I was looking back at the the reading, um, just sort of like based on like knowledge and how it relates to memory and how like knowledge is sort of just based on like a previous language building forward. Um, and thinking about maybe it's like the way that memory is accessed in relation to the current sensation. So like if you specifically accessed the memories of the spectrum of hard and soft things in your that you've experienced then you could have something be both hard and soft but if you didn't um as specifically access that same like memory bank how you could perhaps like categorize something just generally as one or the other um but i'm wow. gonna think more about it uh, that is so interesting and that's so it, have you read hegel at all no, no no i haven't got a chance to you should really when you get a chance i would love to hear your thoughts uh read the hegel reading that i have on the website because he speaks exactly to this you know and it speaks exactly also to what sage was just saying a moment ago mm -hmm. you know that um a thing can be true yesterday uh, but, you know, it's not true now. How do I verify the truth of yesterday and reconcile it with the truth of now and the truth of tomorrow? And Hale really um, talks a lot about this uh, in his ideas on the dialectic and coming up with one. Um, but one of the most interesting things he says in this text is that every statement really is contingent on the opposite statement. You know, if I say, if I at a landscape and there's a tree you know mm -hmm. and I turn around and there is no tree and I say there is no tree here 
that statement that there is no tree is still content is only made possible by the fact that there was a tree a moment ago when I was turned around. I wouldn't look at a blank landscape with no tree and just say there is no tree here unless I was looking for trees or unless I had just seen a tree previous, you know. <laughs> the, the truth of the statement that there is no tree here now is only a relevant statement because there was a tree just a moment ago, you know. Yeah. So there's so much interplay between all of these things and what you just said made me think of that too, you know. And how I think uh, these kinds of ideas would also be essential to coming up with some sort of quantum philosophy, which maybe we can do, guys. <laughs> guys, maybe we could do it. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> Can you define quantum philosophy? I, I what? Don't know, I kinda, what? What does quantum philosophy mean? Well, it, it doesn't mean anything yet because it doesn't exist. We but... haven't finished it yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to make it happen, guys. Yo, uh, quarantine. This quarantine. Let's do it. Yeah, We got a few months. The quarantine will help us. <laughs> somehow. Basically. All right. Nietzsche, Nietzsche was like being nihilistic about objectivity then right he was like not nihilistic Nietzsche like, was totally the way, he, the way he talks about it it's like he says it, he kind of acts like it doesn't matter and that I don't think it's that it, it doesn't it, matter it, it, it doesn't matter not that it doesn't matter but it's because that like the way like humans are going to define objectivity in a way that's like limited by language and all that other stuff, you know? It's hard. Yeah. The only thing you can really uh, trust is like what you're experiencing and how you how you're gonna take it in internally. I don't know. I don't think that's really exactly what he's saying. I think he's making an argument essentially for the idea that logic, although, um, you know, it may seem arbitrary in all of these different ways, and logic is the thing that we use to come to even concepts like objective and objectivity, you know. He's not arguing for the futility of these things. He's ultimately arguing that they are useful, and their usefulness is ultimately determined by us and our very biology, you know. And so when it comes to a question of a thing being hard or being soft, maybe it is both of these things simultaneously in the outer world but the very concept of soft the very concept of hard are concepts that we came up with and in that sense they automatically prioritize the human experience so if it's soft to us then it's fucking soft you know it might be soft and hard in some other incarnation but that thing doesn't even exist the only thing that exists is whatever exists to us, you know. And so yeah. since it's true that our logic and our rational thought already were created from this mode, you know, he talks about the word uh, like literally the letter A as a word, you know. This very thing is a thing that we experience physiologically. The idea that there is an object, you know, that concept is not even a thing that exists externally to us, that there are objects and there are things that exist separate from myself. That in and of itself is a completely artificial construction, but think of the word all and how essential it is to like literally even the most simple statement ever, you know, or the, oh, yeah. the apple is red, you know, even these kidding. things are so prejudiced and biased by our very human cognition yeah. and biology literally everything that we came up with is prejudiced and colorized really by the human experience so ultimately everything that we try to do that speaks of truths outside of this experience and stuff it's not that the effort is completely futile but it's okay to embrace the reality that that our systems of logic and language already prioritize the human experience and we can't escape that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. I, I think that's something that like came up in my head just now when you said we have it's it's really just based on the sensors that we have at our the words that we have that like that we have to describe things. Like we have words for our, like so many different parts of the visual like electromagnetic spectrum, but nothing for like the like X rays. We don't have like a word for what like what something looks like an X ray when it's super bright. Uh, whereas if we had like eyes that could see in that spectrum, we might like need to be aware of that and need to describe it and for it to become part of our um, like 
descriptive factors. Right, and he speaks of yeah. color specifically and how it's different for different species. You know, he gives the examples of ants and how ants see different colors than us. I don't really know what color <laughs> spectrum ants see, you know, but, but he talks about how ultimately every color that we perceive as a separate thing, even though these colors obviously are not actual separate things, you know, uh, that this ultimately is a reflection of a value and a value relationship and that our entire systems of rational thought reveal these value relationships, you know? There is a value inherent in the fact yes. that I can see yellow, you know? Yeah. That has some utility for my human experience and that's why it presents to me and my phenomena as a distinct color. And, like, mm. that, that brings out to me, too, that, like, it's not just things that we can sense, it's things that we can discern, right? Like, we can sense gravity, but, for example, like, say you were, like, a creature that can sense, that can, like, sense things on the, on the scale of, like, a sun versus an earth. You would have much more descriptive phrases for what gravitational effects things have. All we know is that things, like, gravity pulls us towards the earth, and we fall at a certain speed. So that's the only word we need for gravity, whereas, like, if you were, like, a huge like a solar system like size creature you might have a different word for what it feels like when a sun is pulling on you versus when a black hole is pulling on you right <laughs> like do mosquitoes have a word for like the shade <laughs> the shade that we cast on them when our body blocks the sun you know yeah, like yeah, yeah. what's yeah, the difference do. between us and any other ginormous object they probably don't have a conception even of like maybe they do by like the motion like okay this is an active thing i'll get away from it or something but you know mm. it's so true like i always think about how like there's no they get like, yeah they can, like, there, there's yeah, like your 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 literal perception and everything that you experience physically is so obviously going to taint any system of thinking that emerges from that specific perception. And I think that that's the point that Nietzsche's really trying to nail here, you know, and something that I think Hegel really and Aristotle, and I think that's part of why he keeps referencing Aristotle. Both of these thinkers are really uh, concerned with, you know, this idea that our, our thinking itself is so tainted by our literal perception. But um, we've been going on for a while. Let's just make sure that we get to this last section, consciousness, which Gideon has not read, mm -hmm. uh, before we have our final idea. We can go on for forever. But that's not the last want. section. Consciousness like is the last section that we read. There is another one, maybe a few more, but... I didn't want to go out 25 pages. Dude, the last paragraph is the best Thanks. part. What? Last paragraph? <laughs> you just like, like, basically, fuck you, Kant. Oh, when? The last paragraph on page 26. Page judgment. 26. I don't know if it's like related oh, to judgment. the judgment. I didn't read that part. Yeah, I know that it continues, but um, let's just talk about the consciousness part for uh, a bit before we uh, talk about whatever we want and finish up here. But um, this section, I think, was really interesting uh, for many reasons. I think, for one, um, he gives us an idea that we already talked about a little bit that I think is still super controversial to this day. Um, the idea that consciousness, to think of consciousness as this unique soul that we all have some unique innate soul or spirit that we have is really a completely erroneous concept that doesn't make any fucking sense um because he says that a, and he starts this section by saying that substance as a concept the idea that objects have a substance or maybe you could even call it an essence so i really shouldn't but that idea, substance as a concept, he says, is useless as an explanation. It might be true that a thing has a qualitative substance to you as a perceptual being, you know, the apple feels soft or something, but that is useless as an explanation of a thing. And he really uses this idea to say that because I feel as if I have a unified conscious spirit or soul, because I feel like I have some sort of innate consciousness that thinks and does and rationalizes that is not a justification for their being one you know and that kind of harkens back to something he talks about in an earlier section when he's talking a little bit about descartes where he says um 
just because a thinker has thoughts is not proof of the existence of thoughts, you know? And that's basically the same thing he's saying here. Just because I feel conscious does not mean then that my consciousness is some unique standalone entity, you know? He's not saying that it isn't necessarily. He's just saying that there is absolutely no reason to assume that there is such a thing. And I think that the reason he's saying this is because, you know, we all know that this is a very popular idea and it has been for centuries before us and before Nietzsche that there is a human spirit or soul, something innate that thinks and does. And this is part of the justification a lot of philosophers throughout history have given for how there is some fundamental difference between us and other animals and other species you know there's something special yes. about man yes. mankind was yes. chosen to rule over the animals and we have a yes. unique relationship with god because we are enlightened and have yes. transcendental knowledge and all this nietzsche says that that is a huge assumption and to accept that assumption would be to be making a grave error um and also in this section um he critiques psychology, uh, which is also something that Husserl goes on to do after him. And his critique of psychology, ultimately, is that it's erroneous to categorize these hierarchies of thought. And this is a thing that I think is still very controversial uh, when we talk about things like the subconscious, you know. The idea that there is this subconscious thinking being, and then there is this conscious mind I have, the conscious mind that makes statements to myself and thinks about Nietzsche and Hegel and quantum philosophy, you know. These are all my conscious thoughts, and everything subconscious is like, you know, my dad was mean to me when I was a kid. That's like always in the back of my fucking head, and like this and that <laughs> thing going on, you know. Like, he says that this is erroneous, and the justification <laughs> It's stupid. It's because every that we experience in our inner world, really, all of these conscious thoughts we have about Hegel and quantum philosophy and Nietzsche is only made possible through language. So if it's true that everything that feels conscious to me is articulated with language, then what would be the line between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind? If I say to myself, I'm in my head, I'm hungry, I think I want a sandwich, and get up and make a sandwich, is that a conscious thought versus if I sit and just get up and make a sandwich and don't articulate that whole process to myself? Like, I'm obviously consciously getting up and making a sandwich. How often do I sit and think, okay, I will stand now. Okay, I will walk to the fridge. Okay, I will make a sandwich, you know? Like, that, but what's the difference if I do? The only real difference is that I articulated one process back to myself through language. That's it. So the line between conscious and subconscious thought can't simply be that we articulate things with language, you know? So that's basically the argument he makes there. But I think that the most interesting thing about this passage is when he talks about how this whole system of schematization that he outlined for what is the underlying impulse for how we come to things like logic and rational thought, period, is a thing that we should not uh, look to when trying to understand our own processes of consciousness and our inner world, as he calls it. And the reason is because he says that we don't have any organs that guide this process the way that we do when it comes to things like sense perception in our outer world you know the fact that a thing is hard or a thing is soft is because i'm touching it right but we don't have any such tools in our inner world all we really have is language and you know emotional affect and stuff like this which maybe he would say is a sort of physiological guide that we can look to a little bit but you know this is really at the turn of the century when neuroscience was just starting to come into being and I think Nietzsche would be really taken with uh, neuroscience and really interested by it. And I'm sure it would inform his philosophies in a great way because he clearly puts a lot of stock in the natural sciences. But I thought that this was a really interesting uh, argument he made here that, you know, he's using all of these processes of natural science to lay out his argument for how thinking itself is a biological process and our schools of ration are manifest through these processes, but he says that consciousness itself is not beholden to this mechanism. And that's it for my rant. What did you guys think about this? What are the implications and what the fuck you be thinking about? <laughs> We're in the now, old man. So 
Hey, you know what they said? You know what they told me at uh, Sunday school? Those what that reject the spirit go mad. That oh, and that's why you posted <laughs> Nietzsche's neurological illness of Pulp <laughs> Bed <Bedford. laughs> He had syphilis. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure that he went mad because he had syphilis. He had no, he had neuro syphilis. Yeah, syphilis makes you go crazy back in the day because they didn't have treatment for it. So your brain starts to like literally rot That's or something. Because shit. back then the Lord was testing the fate, uh, the fate <laughs> of all the people that Shut were not up. living in the now. Now, people lose their minds <laughs> by just opening up their phones and not knowing what the fuck they're downloading or following. This is another test of God. It's sinful. God sent coronavirus to admonish us for our sins. People that are distracted by the outer world <laughs> instead of looking in, well, finding the ways Okay, let's, from the Lord let's get serious heaven. for a second. Let's get serious. <laughs> of all of these ideas in the now like i i think all of this made me think a lot about artificial intelligence that's like the thing i was thinking of the most yeah. because yeah, yeah what what do you guys think would be like the implications of any of this sort of thinking on any of the popular discourse about like ai specifically well there was um, a Oh, sorry, Wait, hold on. Twig. Oh, Twig. Hmm? I heard you speak. Yeah. Oh, were you speaking before? What's your name no, and where are you I, speaking sorry. to us from? Hi, I'm I'm Twig. I'm from I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I haven't <laughs> talked yet because I've just been lurking because this is my first uh, book club thing. Hi, oh Twig. I've done it before. Hi. Welcome. Um, shit, what I was going to... Oh, yeah, AI. Um, I was actually shortly before joining this talking to a friend last week who does he's a programmer and we were talking about ai and specifically how we keep on making these bots that can do these extraordinary tasks like the, especially for games things that can play dota really well or go or chess really well and he was telling me that at the end of the day it's hard to make something that's outside of our own intellect because we're not necessarily making something that's smarter than us even though it's better than us at tasks we're making things that are better at a certain task at us and better is defined by us and mm. after reading this i was kind of thinking about almost like it's nature uh nature is to us as we are to the ai in that uh like he was saying, I think necessity was sort of dictating the, the affects of our senses and our minds and, and what stays or what doesn't in terms of our ideas. And uh, I guess the same thing would be with AI. I don't know that we could, at least from what I've seen now, and I, I, there is a guy here who does programming, so he'd probably know better than me, but uh, I, I don't know how or at least what it would look like if we could create something outside of ourselves or something yeah, that operates like, outside of our own criteria that's a huge leap that's yeah. a huge leap from where we are right now yeah that's so relevant and this this is part of my beef with the people who act like there will be some magic ai because they can't even articulate what line it is they think will be crossed like to speak about what you were just saying you know that a computer won't really ever do anything that we don't ultimately dictate the parameters for at the most fundamental level, you know. And we already have computers that are far, I mean, even the most simplest computer, a calculator, that thing has already surpassed me in one capacity, you know. It can compute so much faster than I can, you know. And maybe in a way that I can't at all. Like if you, if you ask me without paper to divide 1,381, 5.7 by whatever number you know i'm not going to be able to tell you but a calculator can you know it's already surpassed me in one regard like what is this magical line that people think this threshold will be crossed and oftentimes I, they say like oh it will make its own decision or something and it's I like think, well what i think the way they're gonna do that <laughs> is by um because like because like you're saying, there's like you know calculators that exceed like just normal, like like 
at the average thought process, like calculating like huge numbers in a short amount of time and stuff. And then there's like, you know, programs that are able to recognize face, uh, like your face and being able to uh, unlock uh, unlock us like unlock something or lock something or uh, get, like bypass things just by recognizing the sound of your voice or the way you look or what like whatever you know like they're they're making these small advancements in like several of fields and then they're using like us as like the user to kind of also teach it to recognize things through like algorithms and stuff uh like kind of just modes of thinking by the way we act and how we interact with the algorithm and then how the algorithm responds. And then they kind of like take that data and learn from that. I think the way I, in my, I don't know, really, I don't know, like look into it, but I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to like kind of take all this, all these samples and put it together and trying to like kind of wake it up, trying to make it, <laughs> kind of realize do something by itself that's what it seems like to me yeah well, it sounds uh, like there's still the the limit wouldn't that still be limited by i mean it's collective humanity and it's like almost forcibly evolved humanity but wouldn't the the common denominator there still be limited by and what humans define as as further or better or or smarter yeah, I think it's exactly what you were just saying, Twig. Like, there, there's no way, just as Nietzsche is saying, there's literally no way for us to ever step outside of knowledge to critique knowledge or make a better knowledge. We can't escape our own episteme. You know, the, the same is true for AI. We'll never be able to create a thing that was not ultimately founded on principles that we assigned it, you know? I, I think that maybe the the closest we could get there, you know, we're, we're starting to create self-programming AI. So we're giving AI the tools to program new AI in that sense, maybe. But still, even then, the epistemology well, of the AI will still always be traced back to us, you know? And exactly. something we even created. With, so true. Even with that AI, <laughs> like the main point. That, that's exactly where, I mean, see, this is where it gets really good because, oh my God, this is what's really great about this. <laughs> become the subject. And the question then is, I mean, because that's it, right? Is, is that, that, that that's where um, the, the uh, quantum philosophy is, is sort of starting in, in, in a sense is that in, in, in the philosophy of the subject, um, then it, it 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 becomes we become the subject, right? And then we become mm -hmm. the origin. So the basic premise of self consciousness that even Nietzsche that, that Nietzsche speaks of, you know, individual uh, uh, freedom, it, it it it's in fact actually derived from and 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 produced within a larger process and processes bearing little to no resemblance to uh, subjective experience itself. So the question then are, what questions are we not asking ourselves that AI could ask ourselves? You know, I was just so thinking. The question then is, because um, the idea is this, right? There are, if you are walking in a straight line and humans are all made to walk within a straight line, you, common sense would never tell you to turn left ever common sense tells you to walk straight so the question is then if you if you have if you have someone if you have anything that makes you the subject that turns left what what causes you to turn left and when, and, 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 the, and and how do you get yourself to ask yourself questions you never thought of asking yourself because okay. then you'd have to walk then you'd have to work and work within you'd have to work beyond your own epistemological question see that's why it's interesting because you cannot work with aesthetics because this is what Kant was trying to do and so many other people are trying to do is when you believe something is common sense it is difficult for you to move beyond that 
one of the things is like this, right? When, when, um, let's say you decide, you wake up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you do, you do your whole routine. It's, it, it never occurs to you to wake up and be like, you know what? I want to go like shoot dice with a couple of like, you know, random people on the street it never occurs to <laughs> go into something like that and the reason why it doesn't right we can have a lot of discussion about why it doesn't but it's because it's it's not common sense for you to do so because there is nothing you can garner from that and how you and how you tell how you talk yourself out of a lot of things is to say it is not me so when you apply that to science there are well, that's scientists, a great point there are scientists who will never ever ask themselves questions because the importance the importance that we place now Deleuze and Guattari when they asked them what is philosophy in the 90s they weren't asking a dumb rhetorical question they're asking a serious question because this is the greatest question that nature came up with was when you know all the shit that you know about philosophy what the fuck are you going to say philosophy is worth? And then, oh, Katari and everyone was like, you know, what the fuck is philosophy then? There's no use in doing philosophy. Why are we even doing philosophy? And everyone was like, <laughs> oh shit, actually, we're all going to figure this shit out. We're all going to sit down and discuss why we have to. And everyone was like, you know, we'll, we'll come back in 10 years and, and, then, and then we'll we'll have a couple of answers. And what Katari and Deleuze was saying is that the idea, to be able to come up with concepts is what philosophy is. But philosophy already has, you know, in the grand scheme of things, Hume's fork, in that we are reaching, we are reaching a point where we can't even think of ways of coming up with new concepts. And science requires concepts to refute and verify in any case. So what happens when you can't even ask yourself questions? Because the whole reason why we even wanted to learn about how the world works was because people were asking questions about that shit in the first place. So now mm. we're at a place where we don't even know what questions, what questions to ask ourselves. And the little equations that we're working on are all fine and good, but they're, they're equations that we know we have, that, that, that we already know that are problems. But what do we do about the problems we do not know are problems? That's the question. Mm -hmm. And that's what right. Nietzsche comes up with, because we're at a point where we do not have religion to give us some sort of comfort. The, 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 our, whole, uh, our whole ego and who we were was based on that, is that we have religion and religion will give us these answers. But we've moved beyond that. And yes, we, we are getting to the point where AI is going to come about, but that's gonna that that's gonna complete that's gonna that's gonna create such a shift and that's all good and dandy but where we are right now is what before the shift and we do not even know what questions we want to ask and that's that's uh, what quantum philosophy it makes me think um... <laughs> that's why i have to come up with it <laughs> that that's why i really like nietzsche um everything you were saying you know we have this question of like so what are we supposed to do now and that's why i love nietzsche so much because he's basically telling us we're not supposed to do anything you know thinking exists because thinking is useful and so clearly if thinking exists be because thinking is useful philosophy exists because philosophy is useful and we know it's useful i mean it's demonstrated usefulness and i feel like this is the crossroads we're really at when it comes to philosophy we either need to accept that philosophy has no ultimate usefulness outside of fucking collecting dust on the self-help section or we can accept that philosophy is limited you know it's never going to reveal to us grand truths about the nature of human experience and this or that and it doesn't have to because these things aren't aren't qualitative you know and philosophy has the potential to be qualitative and that's why i really like nietzsche grounding us in this recognition of the understanding that at baseline thinking stems from our very physiology and this is why 
I created Phenomenology Club because I'm definitely taken ultimately with what phenomenology sets as the goal for itself, which is to create the most useful philosophy possible. It doesn't want to just be like, what is truth and what is virtue and like my dad, why doesn't my dad love me? Like it, the philosophy is never going to fucking give us these answers. It doesn't exist to do this and i feel like assuming that it could was the error and an error like that we worked under the assumption of for centuries and centuries and this is why when we observe the history of philosophy versus the history of natural science we see that philosophy is much less linear like we were talking about you know as opposed to natural science where it's like okay uh you know galileo discovered this so now we could do that and newton did this so now we could do that and einstein did this so now we could do that you know like philosophy can take on a similar form if we allow it to but that's going to take a recognition of of the limitations of philosophy itself for so long we worked under the assumption that it could reveal to us these grandiose truths about human uh, experience we need to accept that that it was really a sort of spiritual goal in and of itself and it's 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 not worth pursuing anymore philosophy has so much over. practical application it's not over but no. we need to we no, 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 need... I think it's just no. I'm, calling it, I'm calling it now i think by 2100 it's going to be valuable to get a philosophy degree as it is to get an engineering degree. like not from a like a not just from a like a it's over content in this perspective shit. but like but oh, from like God. a uh like how much money you can make off of it like all, i think all the problems they're about to face are all philosophical questions like yeah, why I, can't we feed everyone why can't why like everything about ai like uh, really well, I think it depends well, well, on where just... we go with it because right now we're still stuck in the mode where getting a philosophy degree means you're just some fucking masturbating asshole that's like oh have you read like and like my paper on, Hi <laughs> my paper on heidegger and uh apple software and it's like dude you're literally so useless you are contributing nothing to society you're just stroking your own ego and it's sad because philosophy seems to be going in that direction like I wasn't just joking when I said it's going to be on the self-help sections. It's already happening. Like, philosophy is being moved to the fucking self-help and poetry sections. We don't teach it in school. Like, we don't really respect it as, as something that has a lot of practical usefulness. And that's really stupid because it does. Like, as Nietzsche says in the very first passage, you know, uh, the, si the method of science is the venerable thing. Science is an institution and a subset of data or a, a set of data. All of that is meaningless. What makes science valuable is the method. And that's what the, the usefulness of philosophy is, too. It's a method. It doesn't reveal truths. It's a way to create truths that have some sort of practical usefulness, just as we do with the natural sciences. But philosophers don't want to recognize this because if you accept that then you accept that the goal of philosophy that we've been pursuing for centuries and centuries was stupid and unattainable <laughs> from the onset you know and that's depressing yeah. it's depressing to people the same way it's depressing when you tell them that you don't actually technically have free will or you don't technically have a soul you know like so people it, don't want to hear that so it depends really what we do with this and i think that this is the crossroads that philosophy is still at and sadly i think that we're actually like going the other direction like philosophy think, has never been more well, I, fucking useless than now i think i think i, I, I think that uh, philosophy has quite a huge place um uh, if we look at a lot of the work that's coming out of uh, MIT. Well, yeah. What's coming out of MIT Point. is really, really good. Um, it's really rigorous as well. I think sociology is a bunch of BS. And <laughs> yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and psychology. Uh, uh, oh, fuck that you know, shit. Questions. Fuck Trojan. <laughs> Why is there hunger and all that stuff? That's all good and well, and and, and I'm glad that there's someone who cares about that. But where um, philosophy is, uh, especially when we are talking about the philosophy of science, and we 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 were talking about really rigorous schools such as MIT, they're they're asking a lot more important questions because 
what life is after after before and during science those are all really great questions and i think there's a lot, a lot to garner from from um philosophy so i i just i just think that we're at a place where we we do have to remember that the question of what is philosophy has been answered okay. and if someone has a better answer or a better retort for why uh, philosophy exists, then great. But the the answer is fucking there, okay? Like, there, we all do just said, for a goddamn reason. Yeah, I, I think something idea. you just said... Wait, can I say this real quick before I forget? I think something you just said really speaks to the problem... Like, it's true that I think the only good and useful philosophy coming out right now is from places like MIT, where math and science are, like, really, uh, they have really strong programs for those. All the most interesting philosophy coming out right now, I think, are from philosophers that are also neuro neuroscientists, that are also computer scientists, that are also, you know, whatever kind of fucking nerd. And this is historical <laughs> in and of itself, too. I mean, the, the most... The most influential and useful philosophers historically are, you know, scientists, natural scientists. They call Leibniz. Darwin. Like, oh, no. <laughs> Darwin, Darwin could have used a little more philosophy. But I think that this is the problem. <laughs> I think that this is the problem is that, you know, I, I went to, uh, I got my philosophy degree alongside my creative writing degree. And like, how are you going to tell me, That's like, I now about. have to learn about neuroscience and uh, quantum computing to have anything interesting to say in the field of philosophy. I think mm -hmm. it hurts. It hurts all, all of these people in academic philosophy who spend so much time reading fucking poems and like doing all this art shit alongside philosophy. It hurts to, to recognize that like, oh shit, if I want to contribute anything useful to philosophy, it has to be informed by the natural sciences. And the natural sciences has so far superseded your average person's like level of comprehension. Like, I, I think that that's what really hurts for a lot of people, myself included. Like, I feel like I have to learn quantum physics and all this shit if I ever want to make any meaningful contributions oh, wow. to philosophy. Because otherwise, what am I going to do? Yeah. Sit around and be like, oh, yeah, this is cool. Like, you know, if you want to have anything useful to say, you have to have mm -hmm. a strong understanding of natural science itself. That's the way it's always been, you know. So I think that that I think natural science has just gone so far so fast that philosophy kind of got left behind. And that's probably why it started to separate itself almost from science, because it just can't comprehend it. It's like, what am I going to do, be a quantum physicist or am I going to be a philosopher? These things are almost seen as like opposite ends of the spectrum where historically like and it's not. Yeah, I think the yeah. next biggest philosopher will but, probably be someone that's also a quantum physicist or something. I think yeah. I think before that there there's going to act okay, like quantum physics is pretty far away, but I think the closest we're at right now is computer science, which kind of Yes. Yeah, but um I was thinking like, <laughs> you know, like with this AI shit, right? You uh I, I'm kind of forgetting it now, but I was thinking earlier, like, you know, in a way, you guys are talking about how we or we're kind of humans are kind of getting a little stagnant in that way. And, and, and a response to that is that, like, with AI, like, you know, um, collecting all this data, in a way, we're creating an observer of the human race by, like, um, having a machine learning algorithm that's like interpreting the data that's available in the cloud you know what i'm saying so basically like ai is heading towards a direction where it is learning how to observe human behavior by just based uh, off all the data that's like we recorded through our time with the use of the, the internet pa yeah with pattern recognition and like um, using like I don't know shit ton of weird ass mathematical concepts and statistics to assess like certain truths that are quote unquote objective. 
I don't know. So and that will be useful too. Like these AI robots would be able to like like you said before, how um they are the next level is creating an observer of but really they they're not able to have empathy, but they're able to mimic human emotions. Well, I, or maybe bypass direction. them. But I'm, I mean, why would they use them if they're yeah? If they don't have to, you know. They don't have to. They just they're just like taking it in, and they're they're creating a response based. That's where I get lost. But that's to me. I've always had this fantasy fantasy of like at the end, like later in the future, there'd be like not an overlord, kind of like Skynet, but not really like Skynet. It's hey, like brother a cloud that's very aware about all your all your posts in like 2012 on Facebook and kind of making general the overseer uh, yeah <laughs> wait the overseer. Elizabeth are you still here yeah I'm still here what are you Karen, can we hear from you I haven't heard from you um I'm just sitting here thinking about AI <laughs> <laughs> Hey, computer science and philosophy. You might have home. some of that. I feel like I just got comfortable for studying sociology. <laughs> you just got what? I just got comfortable. People are coming no. to my throat. I studied I don't philosophy think and saying... sociology, bitch. <laughs> I don't think anyone's saying sociology. <laughs> At its most fundamental, I don't think anyone's saying sociology. I know nothing. The two hey, I, you guys. I think all of those things, honestly, combined with computers, will be like more valuable uh, moving Dude, forward. In this oh, passage, about about that, yeah. in in this passage, he, you know, he he has like a whole paragraph on logic, and like, you know, I don't think we touched that yet. But I'm not gonna. I can't stay any longer. I have to go to work. But just all right. Be there. safe at work. Keep socially be distant. Safe. I'm gonna be in my car, just looking at the wall. It's gonna be lit. <laughs> you can work from your car. Well, I'm. I, I I do security, so. So you can like, stay in your car. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm like basically outside of the building, making sure no one's coming in. No homeless people are trying to pick up any remaining cigarettes outside the office. You know, weird shit like that. Not too dangerous, but you know, kind of risky. Well, if anyone gets up in your face, just leave. It's not worth it. I'll just cough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just stay away. All right, be safe, Gideon. Thank you for coming. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Yeah. Good night. <laughs> um. All right, well, we've been going a while. Like I said, I record these and I upload them. So maybe for the sake of some sort of brevity, we should wrap it up. Um, does anyone have anything that they'd like to say? Any other ideas about, about anything that we touched on tonight? Final conclusions. Physics. My final conclusion is physics. I love knowing that there is no absolute truths that I will ever become fully aware of, <laughs> and that I have no free will. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, because you know who invented you know who invented the concept of free will, bitch. Us. Who invented yeah, the concept of absolute knowledge, bitch? us so i don't give a fuck who came to the realization that both these things are impossible us who asked the fucking question of whether or not they were possible us bitch that's the will to who fucking power to that jesus saves us us <laughs> <laughs> yes yes we rule that's the fucking end conclusion I feel like Nietzsche would agree. We fucking rule. We did it all. We create all the problems and we solve all the fucking problems. But That's the inverse it. But, but, Period. The inver but the inverse of that is that we know nothing also. 
Yeah, but who invented the statement? I know nothing, bitch. <laughs> who invented <laughs> that statement? It was Us. Someone else that thought or said, "I think, therefore I am." Where is Descartes? That? Descartes. Descartes. Us. Descartes. Descartes. Us. Put him on the list. Us. And Hume. Hume shuts him down. And what was Hume? Us. We rule. Don't we rule? Everyone, we rule. You really we quiet rule. all of a sudden. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Probably on my phone. I got too excited. All right. Well, I think we should wrap it up so I can upload this. I just would like to say this was such a good discussion. Thank you, everyone, for being here, especially our new people. You guys are so great. Mwah. I hope that you come to the next one. It's very relevant to so this reading. We're finally going to read Edmund Husserl, the mathematician <laughs> who invented <laughs> phenomenology. Wait, is it next week or the week after that? Week after. We meet, we meet every two weeks, Sunday, at the same time. Um, so the 19th? Yeah, two weeks from today. So, whatever that is. I'm putting it on the we'll website. we'll all still be sitting in our homes alone and lonely. Yeah, we will be. I think <laughs> it might even be Easter Sunday. So, what a better oh, day. Oh, it is! All meet and commune since we won't be with our families. No one's going to celebrate, like, Easter with friends, right? I mean, who the fuck? Good thing we created Easter. Easter! Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and who's not going to celebrate Easter this year? Us. Us. <laughs> <laughs> us. So, Easter Sunday, we, us, are going to meet and talk about this Husserl reading. I have to scan it because I can't find a PDF. I'm going to scan it for my book, so give me a few days for that. It'll be under 25 pages, though, so no big deal. Uh, he's pretty easy to read, too, at least what we're going to read, though he is notoriously difficult and not particularly fun to read. I'm going to pick a text that's accessible. That's my boy. That's daddy. And then we're going to read Heidegger, who oh, is fun, but a bitch. <laughs> but I like him. <laughs> but he's a bitch. <laughs> but, um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I love you guys so much. This was so fun. I'm going to upload it, like, immediately, and then I'll I'll link it in the book club channel all, at all of you. Sorry if my notifications are annoying. I know I send them, like, every five minutes. Um, <laughs> so good. I'm sorry. Me. If you ever need to turn them off, just tell me first. Like, be like, don't. I still, I've been meaning to make a quarantine list. So I can just notify people who want to be notified instead of notifying literally everyone. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Please don't mute me. I love you. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, guys. I'm going to tell the robot to leave. Everyone say bye to Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, bye. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. <laughs> Craig, you stupid computer. You'll never be us. <laughs> ever. Ever, ever. He didn't leave. What the fuck? Oh shit, he's out. Uh, he, uh, I <laughs> 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 he was, oh, no! <laughs> it's AI now! Oh, no! Craig, leave!